selected amongst 41 out of 5,751 is a big deal. And I'm talking about the Talu Group Scholarship Scheme. Today, two of my guests are beneficiaries of the Talu Group Scholarship Scheme. And we want to know schooling, home, and abroad, the difference. This is Extensive Chat. My name is Nana Kesi Kumsen. And we are sponsored by Sabi Fusta, PKE Worldwide, Westland TV, 233times.com, Westline Entertainment, and a host of others. So I'm talking to Albert Tanoe and Fred M.P. Welcome. Thank you. David. Thank you very much. Charlie, you were, would I be right to call you the smartest in Ghana? Uh, well, I, I will take it. I will take it because if I know what I've been through, it's more like going through fire and still coming out uh, on scap. Uh, because um, it, it was not an easy process. I know you're coming to the details, but I will say that the word which kept running through the whole process was rigorous, rigorous, and you don't even know what's happening next. I mean, luckily for some, they knew that oh, the next week, Wednesday, if you don't hear anything, you call it quits. For me, I didn't know. I didn't know. So every time, everything came as a surprise. Then, But I enjoyed the ride. I enjoyed the ride. But as a stance, I always hold this notion that if I buy a new trumpet and keep it in my room and I don't blow it myself, then it's not useful. So I'll blow my own trumpet to say that I'm one of the likely candidates to be called smartest people in Ghana. I'll take it on English rights. Fred, will you be modest? Certainly. <laughs> because I believe everything is race, you know. Um, and for me, it's like a privilege. I see it as a privilege to be part of this group and to be associated with a brilliant <laughs> man. <laughs> A brilliant Qual man. Quality rubs on quality. So <laughs> I also took a lot from you. But you so a, a brilliant man. Like Albert. So it's, 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 it's a good experience. Certainly, you would realize that they are looking not just for anybody, but somebody who can think and think well and also implement things. So it's, it's in, I take it in good faith. Like I would be modest about it. All right, so let's look at education before the Talu Group Scholarship. Which primary school did you attend? Nazareth. To? Nazareth to GSS3, mm -hmm. then GSTS, mm -hmm. Takwaide Polytechnic, mm -hmm. Ghana Telecom, mm -hmm. and UK. So which school were you in UK? Robert Dodger. And which course? IT for Ireland. Yes. So what did you do for first degree? Telecoms Engineering right. and Electrical. All right. Yourself? The schools before the Talu yeah, Scholarship Scheme. I had the privilege of going to a school next door from Annabelle. Uh, uh, within five minutes, I should be at Ridge International School. So that's where I really had my from nursery to uh, JSS. Mm -hmm. um, then went to Infantry School to read science. Then continued to KNUST, mm -hmm. this civil engineering. I worked for some years. Then had was fortunate to be part of this scholarship scheme. So I had a chance to go to Portsmouth University in the UK to read still civil engineering, but this time mastering in geotechnical engineering. For those who feel it's a big way, it's more like ground engineering or foundation engineering, looking at the foundation of uh, skyscrapers. I mean, that's the direction I think Ghana should move to. We should stop being this small, small bungalows on plots. We should be going to the direction of... I, you know, I had a chance to be in China in 2004. And I could see that story buildings, minimum seven story, eight story, nine story. So a plot of land in Ghana where four families can occupy. You won't believe it, but in China it can be occupied by like three hundred families. Oh. Three hundred. I mean they have a strategy of making three bedroom, four bedroom, then they go about fourteen floors. So if they are four and they can multiply by fourteen, then you have about eight or such uh, buildings over. So I was fascinated by them, and I told myself that any time I have the opportunity to come back to Ghana, that's the direction I'll be looking at. Mm -hmm. I'll be making architects and structural engineers think outside the box. That you know what, the ground hold the buildings, and you can, yes you can, you can design structures that can go that high and still be safe in Ghana, and I'll still be confident about it without complaining. I think that's the direction that I, I too, because we need to know more about the soil, because they will carry the building. So. I was really moving in that direction and so far so good for me and I think we are yet to make the impact but uh, it will really get there. I mean, once you have the, the belief and the dream, I personally believe that you get there someday if not now. 
All right, so Fred, let's look at the Talo process, the Talo Group scholarship process. Can you take us through what you really went through to get a scholarship? The stages. The stages. Um, it always starts with the online application, and even with that, when it comes to the statement of purpose, um, it's not an easy one. A lot of people write it and they mess up. So a statement of purpose as part of your online application, then you would write an English test combined with a psychometric test. Then afterwards, you go for a panel interview. And at, during that panel, they will assess you on how you are able to stand on your own in a group. Because whatever we are doing here, I have to be able to express myself well so that I'll be noticed. Though it's teamwork, there are certain things that people do that makes them stand out. Like, um, let me use a football example. You give um, like Messi a 70 30 chance, and such people would be able to convert the 30 percent into a hundred percent. So, in a yes, it's a team, but during that interview, that's what they are looking for. Then, the next level that they will take you to is um, the semi final interview where they are looking at um, whether you know what you are about. You, you didn't just apply for anything. The course that you took, what do you want to do with it? And have you even read about what you are going to do? So they will assess you at that level. Then the final interview, that's where the rigor is. That is where you get to feel the real rigor. Um, a 30 minute interview that will take you through in and out. Your personal life, the way you think in, um, going forward, um, the reason why you are choosing your course, and whether you can stand on your own when you come back. Because going to study, and sometimes you think it's easy, you come, you would easily integrate, but it's not that easy. Because when you come back, you are somebody who has been given a higher education, and you know things, there are a lot of things here that are not standard. So when you come and you want to, like you are in a rush to bring UK down, it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> you get it? So they would, yeah. they would let you know, yeah. or they would ask you questions to know whether you really understand your system before you move out. So those are the things. And believe me, the people who are assessing you, they know everything that you are saying. And every word counts. It's more than being in a law court. Yeah. So, um, Albert, how many months or was it a year? How long was it the duration to get the final call that you, you are a Talo scholar? How many? You see, when, span? Yeah, when Fred was going through it, uh, it's, memories were coming to me. I mean, those <laughs> shivering moments when uh, Shola, one of the panel members at the semi final, would be like, Gentlemen, I think you are joking here. And That's what like, they told you. Yeah, they told me in my face. I mean, you know me and my playful aspects, <laughs> trying to be funny and stuff. Uh, and I was like, hey, is that the final? Yeah, and the final interview, too, I, I had the chance. Um, Anibaba told me, I'm oh, doing the semi final. They said you talk a lot, and it's true. Like, you are talkative. I said, wow, that's one. No, you know, you sit against you. You are not boring, but you talk a lot. I came back and I'm like, oh, I've lost out. They said I talk too much. And had a habit of you telling me that, you know what, it's a plus. They know you didn't fake it. You went there and whatever they, someone said about you, you went and it was not the opposite. So they will feel that you lied about it. So you should be confident about it that at least you are, they are confirming everything they have on paper that that is you. So if you qualify, they should take you as you. And for the process, it starts from January. Mm -hmm. I remember so well um, from 1st January to 31st March. Well, is the period you have to apply. And one of our mentors, Philip Osebons, who, was a, who went about two years before us, he was the one who really encouraged me to, because as one person, I believe that, oh, some of these things, they don't work in Ghana, they know someone. And he said, you know what? He went through not knowing anybody, and he knows my caliber and everything I have in me, so I should give it a shot. So I even waited. I had a TV program. I, I came out and I met him. I mean, maybe it's by, it's divine. I remember the last two days, and I'm like, oh, you know what, I've not even applied. He said, oh, what are you waiting for? Just sit down, and I took my phone, and I was doing the application online. And just like I did my initial, uh, not say song, when I started talking, the statement of purpose, just like Fred said, that is the most important. And I started with this story I told you. I've been to China, I've seen this thing being done, and I believe it could be done in Ghana. 
And that is what they bought into. And once, once I went for the interview, they said, yeah, you said you've been to China. Tell us about it. And that's how it went through. So for me, it starts from 1st January till the final day that I was told that I'm going. I think it was around uh, 24th August. Yeah. You were told to come for a final phase. You had written exams, you know. He, I think he, he, he left that part because it was later when you are selected, you have to write yeah. an IELTS. IELTS yeah, an IELTS exams. English yeah. as a foreign language for you. Uh, to really pass. Even at that stage, you don't even know the results mm -hmm. coming in. Yeah. So virtually from 1st January that they open um, nominations for us, it was 2015, you will know you are part of the final batch going around the end of August. School reopens just two, three weeks on. So I would say it's a period of about six to seven months to really get to know yourself that you'll be part of the team. Let's say eight months, I mean, once August comes in. Yeah, but is it your first time applying? Yeah, it was my first time. I, I, I heard about it in 2011 when uh, another colleague, architect of mine, Kofi Asidu, was telling me that oh, some of his friends are on there. I really had this scholarship from Talu and they are moving. There were a few, I think 11 or so, the first batch. Then I said, oh, is that so? <coughs> Sorry. I don't know, but maybe, maybe they just knew people there and stuff like that. So I didn't even want to think because I don't know anybody. Mm -hmm. The truth was that I didn't know anybody and up till now I don't know anybody. If you ask me that, oh, how better can you help me to get it? I'll tell you that I don't know anybody. <laughs> Maybe I can coach you with the little things that I did. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I even have to pray, pray about it, fast about it, that I'm part of the selected few because you don't know if someone might wake up on a bad mood and it can affect your assessments in there. So basically it was my first time doing it and I really, it was a smooth ride for me. For me, I will not say there were a lot of hiccups along the way, just one serious hiccup. That until uh, now, I hold it that um, God wanted me to be there. I mean, you know, before I, I went to UK, I was more like, ah, why do Ghanaians always say God, God, God? And I, from UK, I learned it. We were talking about systems here. Mm -hmm. If you come from a country yeah, where systems don't yeah. work, you, you believe that the God factor, one of, one of our main exactly, the God factor will yeah. never be lost in there. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was my first time, but I had that opportunity. A door was nearly closed, but. God be so good, it was open again for me. A window was open for me and I got inside and became part of the faithful 41 that were really chosen to be on this scholarship scheme. That was part inside Chapel Hill, Takra Day. And we are talking to Talu scholars. They were amongst 41 out of 5,751 chosen to study in the United Kingdom. And I'm um, speaking to Albert and Fred. They are taking us through the process. But I want to know from Fred, is it your first time? I have applied for the scholarship four times. Four? Yep. From the very first day to the last day. Wow. So it should tell you, um, like that fairness thing, <laughs> yeah. is always there. On the days that, on the occasions that I lost out, mm -hmm. I knew I lost out. Mm -hmm. Because you will go Fair to, a, yeah. and yes, you will go for an interview, and when you come back and um, you, re you realize that you didn't answer their questions, you know. Mm -hmm. On my second attempt, that was when I was progressing steadily. And for that one, any time I came out, I knew it was okay. Then something happened. I don't know whether I should blame myself or whatever, but I went for that Western interview and finally I couldn't make it to the final interview. So it was cool. So finally I decided, oh, this is it. I'm done. Maybe it's because I also don't know anybody. So in 2013, that's like, this is not for me anymore. Then um, in 2015, the whole process started. Everybody had applied. I was even doing it for a friend. And I said, let me put it in for myself. And then lo and behold, by the time I realized I was scaling from one level to another, one level to another, and something happened that's really fun. The, after my final interview, before that mail for you to go and write um, the IELTS, right. I was, no, it was before my final interview. I was supposed to travel to Nigeria with my boss. So everything had been prepared and I was set. I was actually called on Friday that I should prepare for my flight on Sunday. Then all of a sudden, my boss decides not to take me along. So Sunday after church, I call him and he goes like, 
I'll go alone. You wait for me. Okay. And I went to the office. I was so much devastated. I was like, ah. Yeah, your plans. I, I, I had planned yourself. and gone for this interview. Things that have slowed and now oh, this is not my game. I'm out. Then Wednesday, I was in the office. Everything was quiet. Late afternoon, something tells me take your phone, go through your mail. I take my phone, went into my mail, and I realized that I've been invited for the IELTS interview. I think on Friday. I was like, wow. Almost there. <laughs> wow. So what it meant was that if I had left for Nigeria, mm -hmm. it would not have been possible mm -hmm. for me to attend that interview. So it told me that indeed God's hand was at play. It was strictly divine intervention. There was no way I could explain it. There was no way. And lo and behold, when I went for the final interview, it worked out. Nice. It, for me, though, the interview I enjoyed the most was the final interview. Yes, it was gruelling, it was rigorous, but you walk out of that interview and if you answer them well, you feel confident, you can go within yourself and say, yes, I've nailed it. Yeah. But if you don't do well, you know. Nobody will tell you. Yeah, so I, I want to know, where were you when you had the email that you are a Talu scholar, you've won a £35,000 scholarship wow. to stay here, but where were you? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, I remember so well. I was on radio, I was at Melody FM doing sports in the morning, you know. My job, I was managing a site close to St. Mary's. So in the mornings, I tried to go there, set them up. There were two Lebanese working under me, so they supervisors. So I just put them, tell them what to do and I have a little time. I go and sit on radio to enjoy my hobby. So I was doing sports, and before then, they, I mean, a week earlier, they had talked about international. Some teachers had come to the studio, and I was telling them that, oh, I was going to Portsmouth. The lady said, really? I said, yeah, I'm going to Portsmouth. She even thought I was joking. I was, I don't know, but it just dawned on me. I said it on radio, yeah, live radio. Live wow. radio. So that very day, I was talking, I had a mail. You know, it comes with a lot of jitters and everything. So. I had a mail, then I opened it. I mean, there was this guy sitting by me, Kofi Edu. Uh, now, the medium of Piero. Then I showed it to him. That is what I, you have been selected to be part. Congratulations, blah, blah, blah. I was reading through. Just I started getting headache. I was started blabbing. I was speaking when I was opening it. And I'm, I'm one person. I don't easily concentrate on two things at the same time. So, right from there, you could see that I, I was blabbing and not really speaking a lot of uh, gibberish. was coming from my mouth and... I showed it to Ekoi Sophie and right from there, I said, oh, Manitra is going to UK. On air? To, on air, on air. Our mind was, we started the whole celebration from there. That wow. Manitra will be from the next month, September, he'll be in UK reporting there and he will not just be sitting in the studio and discussing it. So, it, 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 they were brilliant moments. They were just very good moments. Just after the show, I came out, I called uh, Obi and Obi said, oh, and Nanako is here. He also called me that. Oh, I said, who is Nanakwesi? Okay, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know any Nanakwesi, so you let me leave it there. But I said, oh, two of my mentees have really gotten the scholarship. And I said, fine, so what's next? Because it's, it's funny, Some just that morning or a, a day before, I kept calling him that, so what can happen next? What is happening? Is it possible that I ought to be a reason not to be paid? Because I know it's just the final phase. Once I pass that, I'll be called and it's just English. And So there were, there were brilliant moments. I mean, I was in the studio. And right from there, I started making noise, and we celebrated it in all. And I, I miss those moments. I mean, they were one of the finest moments of my life because I wanted it badly for me. As much as I was not too serious with it, I was. I wanted to go and do my masters outside. So I was trying Germany, reading about them. D A A D. People were giving giving me sites to go to. Some they have to pay for applications, and I said, no, but I don't have the money now to be paying for some of these things. But something tells me that I need to do my second degree outside. So. It, it was just good. God just brought it to me. I mean, 40,000 scholarship for uh, not knowing anybody and no serious commitments to it. I said, wow, uh, God works in a mysterious way. So I remember those times and they were, they were happy moments. I don't know whether I can get them again, maybe if I marry an <laughs> orgasm or something, but that feeling is still orgasmic. Okay, <laughs> what were you when you heard um, about uh, that you won the scholarship? But before then, um, cheers to you. Yeah. And congrats, you, mm. you're almost done. Yeah. 
Right. So this very, is very nice. Coco Mayo from Salvi Food It's very nice. I love it. I love it. I, love yeah. it. I mean, it's, it brings everything. You can feel the milk, the coconuts. Yeah. I mean, this, the sweetness is beyond measure. Fred, what were you when you had, when you had the email? I was, I was at the office. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, our office is usually crowded. But on that day, I happened to be the only person at the office. Wow. It was an afternoon. <coughs> so when I read the mail, I just closed every door and began shouting and jumping in the office. Like, wow, I finally, this Eureka, this is it. Yeah. Was, it's been something that I've been chasing for so long. Yeah. The fourth time. When you realize that, um, like they say, persistence always pays. Mm -hmm. And along the journey, um, I, have, I have learned some things. Mm -hmm. Um, experience like my mistakes in the past I really learned from them and I also realized that sometimes it's not you don't just give up even when it gets tough because I believe there are times your emotions will be played with yeah. no matter who you are and until you man up to accept it it's tough so that afternoon there was, there was no way I could hold myself back Right from my office in Kaneshi, I jumped from there to La Paz. <laughs> I was just wow. jumping and I didn't know what to do with yeah. myself. It, it was really a good feeling. Yeah. It, and it's been a while ever since I felt that way. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was really good. And that moment, there's nothing that I could do but always say thank you, God. Yeah. Oh, that was the only words that would come out of my mouth. And I began to call friends when I got home. Hey, they've called me, they've called me, and they've, oh, they're like, yeah, hey. it was all of a sudden, you have become the family hero. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, such, such great moments. So I'm also, I mean, all of a sudden. <laughs> I'm just wondering, um, going to the UK, so let's look at your first time in the UK. Yeah. You land in the UK knowing that you are covered by £35,000. Let's talk about the first time in the UK. What, what, um, how, how was it? Do you remember the first time landing in the United Kingdom? Yeah, I, I remember so. I'm happy you had to skip the visa process because it was smooth <laughs> for all of us. I mean, you know, it, it, would be, it would be great to share. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it was a nice one. Right from there, we were, we were told to come for the pre visa uh, briefing. Me, yeah, briefing. I mean, then they gave us letters, I mean, introductory letters. They said, oh, just. Just fill this one, add it to it, and present. But for tier four, what you have is tier student visa. There will be light, light interview. Mm -hmm. they, they have to be sure. So you'll be interviewed through Skype from somebody in Sheffield. And you, you, need, to, you need to be up for it because they want to be sure it's you and coming. And fortunately for me, I had this young chap, I think, from Pakistan. He, then he just, I just sit and he tells me, I know what I'm typing. I start black talking and he's like, no, take your time, take your time. I'm, I'm just typing so you don't make... Then he asked me my course and why I'm, what I'm going to do. Then I started talking and he's like, oh, he's even a second year student doing architecture. And I said, oh, so I, I, I need to even slow down and be confident and be cool because he's just I mean, a, yeah, a, 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 yeah, a young chap <laughs> trying to better his slots who has been given the opportunity to type the things I say mm -hmm. for another panel to decide on. Oh, he's even doing, he's planning, he likes engineering and one day he wants to be part of I, so how do I intend to stay in the UK? Right from there, he started talking, telling me that oh, if you go, I shouldn't, I should go to Poundland. Everything is one pound. We, when you come, you understand. You, could, you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> it was smooth. It's like, oh, you, when you come, you understand. And I'm like, oh, I thought you were telling me I'll give it to you or not. But I said, when I get there, I'm advising you, when you come, make sure you get your blanket, go to Poundland. You can buy four bottles of Coke for one pound. Make sure you go for such stuffs because they are good. They are quality. He's even doing them. So... For me, the visa, the next moment they called me, come for your visa. And I learned, I, I get, I, my, I traveled to China before, but going to Europe was always a dream destination. For me, I felt that was it. Europe, Canada, Australia, US. I mean, these are places when you are going, you need to be careful. You can't even be brought back home and stuff like that. We get to the point, we are all told to get down. I get to the immigration officer. He asked me, just a Pakistani. I mean, it's funny yeah. how I meet them all along the way. He asked me, what course? I mentioned, you know, my course is very long. Sometimes they don't even want to know. He said, okay, that's all. I put my finger on. But I think the best experience was uh, getting on a bus to Portsmouth. 
I, I get there and I'm like, oh, I just, I want a bus. I thought I had to go and pay. They said, no, those are, those are machines over there. I should get with them and buy a ticket. I said, wow, these people know I'm coming from. I have money, I should go and talk to a machine and they would get to give me a ticket. I said, no, no, I can't do this. I stood for about 10 minutes. People were buying. Then fortunately for me, a young lady was by, I said, wearing one of their t-shirts. Then I said, oh, I don't know how to do this thing. She gets to it. Oh, you are going to a port one. Papa, £19.50. I just get there and they tell me that, oh, it's here in six minutes. I'm like, wow, yeah, are they sure? My country, when they say six minutes, it turns out to be 60 minutes. <laughs> Within, when they said deal, I don't know how it happens, but later I was learning through the, the lines. I saw bus, bus is deal, then the bus was approaching. A young man comes out, a lot of tattoos. I'm like, hey, with earrings. I said, ah. the, the bus driver I said, I'm going to Portsmouth. I don't know the place. He said, don't worry. The, the guy picks my luggage, put them in the bus. He says, oh, for this bus, you'll be there in five hours, not three hours. So uh, by 2.48, I'll be there. That time, it was around 10.48 or so. Tells me about 2.48, you'll be there. And truthfully, we got there at the same time. I mean, the position with time in the UK. Or I went, I've had it. You know, this scholarship has taken me uh, to places. I've been to Belgium, I've been to Italy. Where haven't I been? I mean, yet I'm even still enjoying the fruits of the scholarship. <laughs> and if you have anybody who gets the chance to really get on. So, virtually, you realize that they, they were time conscious. One thing I learned about this that the weather too, when, when you got there, it was getting close to winter. I, I, will, I landed on the 25th. I, I, I think I was with Fred and yeah. I mean, other yeah. friends, and they were going to Abedin. We got there. Yeah. They had to move on. We had to continue again by bus, some by air. And I'm like, no, maybe I should have been to Aberdeen. Right from there, I started having regrets. That's why I didn't I choose Aberdeen? <laughs> I would have had a chance to sit in an airplane <laughs> again to continue my journey. All of a sudden, I'm going by bus and by bus. But it was an interesting one. I get to the school. There were people there to help me out. Everything for me. And the, the, the comfort, the comfort and... As soon as I got there, my phone, they tell me that, oh, they said, Jerome, I should log on to. I, I put it on and fast internet. I'm able to call friends back home that, oh, I've already landed. And everything, everything else was smooth. I mean, if I start talking about that, you'll be in Wonderland before I realize I might, I might even be in another world. So I think that was my first experience is that the people I met, they were very friendly. The buses were on time. Everything that was, it was like the truth being put on, on the table for you. Nobody was trying to dodge, be dodgy about anything. When, once they tell you that this is it, it happens. Going to register for my course and everything. You could realize that the systems were there. They know what they are doing. You take this letter, people call it bureaucratic, but I call it that they, they are not bottlenecks because they know how to or loosen them. You get to the bank, they tell you that what do you, what do you need? Oh, get a letter from the school, your accommodation, your address, then just bring it with your passport. You get there, you present these documents, they open an account for you. I tell them that you have to pay. They say, no, you're a student. You don't need to pay anything. You walk out and within five minutes. I've walked out from the bank and I have my card and everything. I could just take money and uh, so I, I, I saw them very interesting, you know. And I had to take a lot of clothes, clothes going there, thinking that Obi was telling me that oh I don't need them. I said no, me I want to save a lot of money. I have a lot of clothes in there. Let me get them. So I packed them, uh, less food, a lot of clothes. I my first shop I went to Primark. I entered a shop and the clothes are one pound, one pound fifty. And I'm like, but these things are cheap. Why did I even carry all these clothes here? I shouldn't have brought them. In fact, right from that, I started regretting taking a lot of clothes. But I could see that this is heaven on earth. Things were cheap, were relatively cheaper, and everybody was laughing. And so for me, the experiences in the UK, I understand why Fred had to be jumping from Kanishi to La Paz. <laughs> because if, if, you, if we always had dreams that these places would be nice, but once we, he who feels it knows it. Everything there was smooth to the, to the, I don't know even the, I don't want to say some people because sometimes it's rough. So I enjoyed, I enjoyed my ride and I'm still living in that mood till today. Fred, your first time in the UK? Mm. We both left Kotoka. It was, it was a 10.30 flight. Yeah, right. yeah. But yeah. The, the, the plane was nice. At least be here to yeah. UK. It's always it's one of the best you can exactly. get. Exactly. With this six hours we had, to be and there. We, we land. Then did we finish the initial screening stage? When you see when we yeah, alighted, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. the initial screening, we all went through the terminal. Yeah. Then we got to the point where they would say, Portsmouth people take this yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I bet you people yeah. continue from here. I'm sure that's why. Yeah, yeah. 
They told me to exit the airport. <laughs> I had to enter UK, but you had so, a second chance. So we continued through the tunnels, and by the time we realized again, we were on the tarmac waiting for another flight to take us to Aberdeen. But we got to Aberdeen around, it's always 10, it's always um, an 11.30 flight from London to, to Aberdeen. So you land in Aberdeen around 11. Mm. When we landed, it was fun. We, we were met by another scholar, um, Tomo, okay. who he and uh, uh, his crew, they received us at the airport oh. and took us to Wumahi, one of um, Robert Gordon's um, hostels, mm -hmm. and showed us around. I think we got there on Friday, so there was no way we could register. Yeah. Then one funny thing happened. We were so excited such that we could not stay at Wumahi. So Abdallah and me, yeah. We walked all the way from Wuma Hill <laughs> to, to Compass. And then we are talking about <laughs> four kilometers, five kilometers walk. Wow. Just so explore. It's, it, was, it was nothing but the excitement. So let, let's make it easier. From Market Circle to Kwisimiti <laughs> Moor of Apremado. Yes. Yes. Wow. yes. Like from Market Circle to Apremado. Walking. Walking. Wow. But we couldn't feel it. And it was cold too. Yeah. But just that excitement and the thrill of being in the UK didn't make us realize, yeah, you didn't even realize what we were doing. The air was even different. You could smell something. <laughs> so, in quarter shops, were there any? The moment you get there, you see the tattoos and the earrings on men. <laughs> that one would always let you ask questions, huh? Yeah. And you see here, um, anybody with tattoo or what we call rasta, yeah. is ruled out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when, when you get there, you realize that a banker would have tattoos yeah. all over her yeah. body and she's right behind the counter. Mm -hmm. The airports, whoever, you meet people working in the airports, some of them holding, because I cannot tell, but from the way they are dressed, mm -hmm. they are holding responsible positions, yeah. but peers and all that, yeah. and they are doing their work with them. So for them, that's, I told myself, oh, so it's about what you can do. It's not about yeah. how you look. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was when I began to um, reprogram myself on looks. Yeah. And really understand, understood that looks can always be deceptive. Yeah. So you go through them, you see people, and one thing that also uh, made me go, huh, was ladies smoking. Yeah. It's normal. Mm -hmm. Here, seldom will you see a lady smoking in public. <laughs> but you get to house Virginia and you realize that ladies smoke more than men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You realize, and it's normal. You don't, you, you can't even raise a criticism. Yeah. That, yeah, no, 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 no. So some of these things actually made me expand my, like, my thoughts. I had to break down and stop being critical and judgmental. Because you go into class with somebody who party last night very hard, but in class you find that the person is performing as he should. You will come to class on time, do everything as orderly as he, he should. But over here, we always think, oh, it's the morally, quote unquote, the morally upright people who can always do those things. So that experience actually enabled me to open up a lot, stop being judgmental mm -hmm. and being too critical about especially tattoos and all those things. They matter, but they don't matter. Mm -hmm. And another thing that you would also realize is that in Ghana, God is a big deal. <laughs> and believe me, indeed it is, because in a system, in a place where there's no system, you you cannot do it without God. Yeah. Look, Nami Nima on Ye. But elsewhere, they can because systems work. Yeah. Uh, we come to the systems and um, uh, it's a whole topic that yeah. I really yeah. wish you would spend a lot of time yeah. on. Um with a culture shop, if you can yeah. brief yeah, us. Yeah, I think I think Fred has said a lot, I'll just top it up. Um you realize that I mean from when he started speaking or when he got there, then Growing up at Trade International and other places, we always told that the whole world is like a storybook. So if you've never traveled that, then you're still on one page. Meaning what? You can read everything, but till you are there, 
to experience it, you will never really understand. Certain things, you see the whole idea of the scholarship, they take us out there to go and learn, imbibe British knowledge, come back home and share, just like a platform like this that you've given us, for people to have other outlook and see life differently. I was particular, uh, particularly, um, on a Sunday, I wanted to go to church and you were technically giving money to go to church. You will not believe it because where we are staying and where the church is, they need to come and pick us. Then we get there to you are giving food. Mm -hmm. You were practically begged to be in church mm -hmm. in the UK and I'm like, wow. And it continued. I thought it was a nine day wonder, but for like three months, that was what we were enjoying till I left that church to join another. So I realized that. And I, I, another time I didn't join the car, so I called the cab to come in, a taxi to come and pick me to church. Then they were, I went and realized about their taxi drivers, very knowledgeable. They like to, they are chatty if you really want yeah, to. As when they realize you're a foreigner and you want to engage, they are people, they, they don't really, they are not. Are racial, I mean, for lack of a better word, they like to engage, and most of them are from some from Eastern Europe, some from Asia, and stuff like that. Then the guy was, this time I met a British, and he was like, Why do people always come here on a Sunday? And he's surprised. I said, I'm going to church. So I pay seven pounds, get a taxi to go to church. The guy was so surprised. And I'm like, ah. But being in Ghana, they told her this people brought us the Bible. But it looks like <laughs> they have a different idea about religion, the way they see them. And I'm happy you said you go to the cultural aspect. Like we were here, and I'm, I was asking you, I hear prophets talking about 30, <laughs> prophet, 30 uh, prophecies that can happen in 2018. And I said, so do they have them in England and US? And I was asking you, do they have prophets doing those things too there? Because I, I realized that they are not really very religious. They don't really, uh, they are not so much into that thing. So uh, for me, that was one of the major, major issues that I really uh, saw. The rest, I think uh, Fred has really taken us through. As and when they come, I will really share them. It's extensive chat and I'm talking to Italo scholars. And these are people who have extensions in their courses. And they are people who have first class in their first degrees in Ghana. So it's only fair that I speak to them concerning education in Ghana and in the UK. So let's come to education in Ghana and the UK. Let me start with you, Fred. Um, What's, what's the difference? Is there a big contrast? Is there any? Yes. So it's always about the approach to learning. See, if you are teaching a child something, and it, you see, there, 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 are, there are two different things. Knowledge and wisdom. No. Similarly, they are the same, but believe me, they are not. Two different things. Two different things. Our education here tends to be more knowledge based. Their education tends to be more wisdom based. Because whatever you are doing, they would make you see its practicality, its inaction, and even encourage you to put it to work. Whether it's social sciences, whether it's um, theology, whether it's arts, science, you, whichever way class history, whatever you do, they will make sure that you are able to acquire the vocational aspect of it. Because sometimes here we can easily cram things. People can easily memorize notebooks and write an exam and you think that's okay, he's good. But when he gets to the field and he's supposed to work, you realize that he actually cannot do anything. Because what, uh, there, are, there are always certain tricks that you can only learn when you have experience. Yeah. And like my, 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 always my example, I was walking on the streets of Aberdeen and I saw these kids who are going up following a teacher. I asked myself, ah, what are they doing? Then I hid myself in a corner and decided to just see what they were doing. Then as I watched, they got to a traffic light. Then they stood there, waited for the traffic light to go red, gold, green, the walk <coughs> sign comes in. I was like, ah! So all of this is to just to let them know red means stop, yellow means get ready, green means go, 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 and go. 
here you would sit in the nursery and you'll be singing a song, red means stop, yellow means get ready, green means go, 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 and go. But elsewhere, you will not just sing that song, you would actually do it. So when you are speaking and when you are saying something, you have an idea of what you are doing. That it is not something that you are just saying because your teacher says you should say. You see it actually working. You go to our villages and all the kids do is sing the song. Most of them have not even seen a traffic light before. You, so this is the difference. You will not just read, but you would see it in action, as, even at the nursery level. Then you bring it up, cramming, and you, Nana did not write an exam. He did what is called a coursework. Yeah. They'll give you a long essay, you, they'll take you through a model, they'll take you the, the write 1,500 words right. essay on it. And you think, Nana started thinking it was easy. 3,000. <laughs> You yeah. initially you would think it's easy, yeah. but for you to be able to come out with a good work, this is what you realize. You realize that you learn more, you understand the concepts better, and you see it in action before you are even able to bring that yeah, work out. And you know that whatever you think you thought you knew about that particular subject matter, the moment you begin to read other people's public, uh, publications and papers. On that matter, you are you are forced to shut up yeah. and be humble. Yeah. You will know that you don't know. So in that end, they will tell you not to copy, but they will tell you to paraphrase, and that is where you learn. Yeah. It's not that writing it the way. Yes, I've read it, but write it in a way yeah. that you understand it. To mean the same. To mean the same or add yours to it voice. In, in, in a way. That is where the true learning is. It's theory, but they found it, they found a way to make it so practical that whether you like it or not, you feel you are part of it. So you won't do a work and you think, let us for this one, somebody did it for me. You know you've made an input in that work. And years after, when you are asked, you don't need to do uh, looking yeah. for a particular work, a, a particular work or something. But because you did it, you can actually explain the concept in the way that anybody who picks it up can understand. I'm not lying. Most of our people write exam, and the moment they leave the exam, or when you ask them something small about the subject matter, it's gone. It's poorly. Yeah, they poured it so they don't have any. They don't, they don't even see the need to even keep it there. That's, that's the word, pour. You don't, you don't just share. Yeah. Pour. <laughs> you just pour it. And when, and you see, when you pour something, it always drains, and it drains away. So that's what we do. That's the major difference. Then, I, I one small thing. When I did engineering here, I did electrical engineering. The first time I went to site, I was told to do a continuity test. And they gave me a long cable, let's say between here <laughs> and um, let's say a cable that spans. It was a, 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 a site that was big. So let's say about um, 10 meters. Mm -hmm. So there's no way I could use my multimeter to touch one end of the cable and yeah. go and touch the other end. What can I do? So I was <coughs> struggling with all what I knew. I, the tool is holding me. And I was that night with them. Then the people, the technical school boys, and the people who had been um, apprentices, mm -hmm. yeah. they started laughing at me. They would say, You call yourself a yeah, engineer. Yeah. And, you, yeah. <laughs> and you cannot even do a contestable continuity test. Then they taught me this. They picked another cable, tied it at yeah. their one end. So at one, uh, at one end, they joined two cables. Mm -hmm. Then when I went to the other, it was, it was yeah, in there, yeah, every electric yeah. acid is always like the neutral. Yeah. So they, they closed it at one end, so I could go to the other end and easily touch the leads with it. This thing would never be taught you in the classroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get it. And these are the vocational aspects of the things that we study. And here, yeah, it lacks. 
when I was doing Java, you don't cram to write codes when you are writing a Java exam. <laughs> if you know Java, if you are doing Java, code Java. Yeah, but you write exams then. Here, the pack, and then pen, and you do everything, they will give you, then you code on paper. But over there, a Java exam, was, they understand that in every everything or every programming that you are asked to do, there are more than five ways of doing the same thing. Yeah, the same results. And you get the same results. So let's say if I know, or the teacher teaches method A, and that is what the whole class knows, <coughs> and I go and read the method B, and it's comfortable for me, there are times you will go and write that, and the teacher will give you, mark you down. Yeah. But elsewhere, they will tell you if it works, it works. But you will only just take the code and run it. And when they even want the best, they will look at how long it takes to process that code. Because a code that may take 10 lines to get the result, another person can code it in two lines. And the one that is coded in two lines would be more efficient than the one that is coded in 10 lines. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the teacher taught the 10 line one, but because I understood the concept, I've gone behind to learn the two line one, and he may mark me down. So that, those are the subtle, they are not subtle, they are open difference. Open difference. Yeah. Open differences. That's it's yourself. Open. Yeah, I, I think Fred has said a lot, and we are not here to downplay the educational system in Ghana, but we are telling you, sharing with you our experiences there. You see, when I went to KNUS, I remember so well, I had that book, but it's, uh, <laughs> one doctor came to teach us that there's, there's, there's skills in learning, cramming, babadier, Memorizing. <laughs> he, a doctor, he has a book, a whole book at KNUSD. university. Those who were there that time, I'm sure one of my mates will have it. It's a whole book is written. That this world, everything can be learned. You can, everybody can memorize. He had a kid and he made this example. He had a, a kid at home and he started teaching the kid A, B, C, D by once they start, the child started speaking around eight months to um, one year. A, B, C, D. Join words together. By the time he took the child to school, the child could recite A, B, C, D, recite one, two, three, and all the teachers were saying the kid was brilliant. So he was telling us that everything can be learned. They don't know how long it took to really let the child memorize that thing, but once he can do it now, everybody around, even his friends, when they come to the house, hey, we were being power. Hey, at this age, and your kid is saying this. So he's telling us that we should learn to memorize. That was what I was told my first day at KNUST. I mean, I will not write it off. I get to, you we were talking about us having distinctions. It helped us. If it was not too good. You didn't go there to get that. But see, I had a chance to meet a doctor, a friend I was with here, that is now a doctor there. We were in the same office. That he was, uh, Quanti Sobea was uh, an engineer, but now he's a doctor in the UK, teaching at Coventry. Then I was having these frustrations. I started discussing with him. Then he told me that, you know what? In UK, there are two ways of testing a kid. Depth of knowledge and weight of knowledge. Depth is what Fred spoke about. When they give you a topic that may be how, does, how to make a tumbler, go and give me 5,000 words. You need to go on YouTube. Even internet in Ghana, it's a problem. A friend came from US, he buys one of these, I don't want to mention their names, he gets 30 gig, he sits by his TV, and the next morning, everything gone. And he's so frustrated. He bought it over 150 cities. And he tells me that you, in, back in the US, he's paying $99.99 for unlimited for a month, which is less than 50 cities. And he's in Ghana paying 150 cities, and he can't have it for two days. <laughs> because he's streaming, trying to have, watch Netflix and stuff in Ghana. And he's complaining. I say, you know what? You better put this in our way. Go and get some, one of these decoders that they pay and watch. Because internet in Ghana is hell. But you are watching TV, and... Uh, they will tell you that log on to BBC online to continue watching this program. And nobody complains. So, oh, okay, okay. Then he goes on his computer. He's watching because internet is, a, is closer to you than water. That's how to put it there. You know what? When I wake up from my bed, my phone, I pick it and I'm browsing. Water, I have to get up from the bed and go and walk to the fridge. So, internet is cheaper and closer to me than water. I mean, I, and I was so fascinated about it. But in Ghana, water is cheap. Internet, even I don't have credit to browse. And I still need to continue learning. So for me, and when I got there, my personal experience doing masters, I think that one will help better. We are, we are giving course outline, and they tell you that 30 hours frontal lectures, 300 hours private learning. 
when I, but we paid money to come here to be taught. How why are you telling that you go and learn myself? That's how it is. That's how it is. I, I get the lecturers st stand before me, structural engineering, only two hours in a week on Monday, two hours. The rest I have to do on it on myself and do design and how to use all oh, this special program when it comes from this at the end of the day you have to do you give your project work and you have to use it losers i mean those some of the engineers are using it here now losers you have to learn it on yourself and do programming and you give your coursework that you have to do at the end of the day you are going to design a whole building all the structural elements and all those things so i realized that just like fred said that place they, they teach you to really be more practical mm -hmm. you come out and you are bold i went to KNUST. you come out and you people ask you do not you start do not use this you say you don't know how to use them but you passed and you've had very good grades and they expect you to be a civil engineer i mean that's the problems you have in ghana mass spectrometer i did it at ss we were drawing them and stuff you've not seen them before you get to first you tell me that even community colleges community universities the things that they have in their lab you don't have them in KNUS. you can't boost with them i mean those are some of the the practical truths and at the end of the day we are doing engineering in vacuum people are in virtual deflection meters and stuff as at KUST, we only discuss them you don't see them Charles their test there's one old one rickety one there all of us must stand by them and you don't even get what is being done you have to write exams on them but you get to this system you get to the library you can even borrow a laptop go and sit with the laptop have all the programs in there to the extent that if I want a book and I, I see that, oh, it's in Southampton, it's in Aberdeen, I walk to the library, I tell them that I need this particular book. And within, they tell you that within one week, come for it. The idea is that anything you want to pass your exams, they are ready to provide for you. Anything next to anything. And most of the learning, you do it on your, uh, yourself. You go on YouTube, the things you can learn on YouTube, even in Ghana, you, it's a marvel. You. I came, I, start, I started talking to friends, and they are doing it. Those who did this culinary, uh, cakes and stuff. You can go on YouTube, learn how to make cake, even if you want to exercise, to slim down. It's on YouTube. This eye-opening experiences. I had them in the UK. That's your lecturers will tell you that. Even every calculation you want, you get on there. People have sat down. They want views and I'm told they are paid for. That, oh, you want to calculate how to make a fan turn. Okay, from first principles, you add A plus B, you get to this. Even difficult subjects in Ghana can tell me that, oh, I don't understand my teacher teaches and I don't understand. You get on YouTube, it will teach you a white somebody's angle. Just like I said, I, I had to do for trans 77 back in 2002. I was we had been programming at KNUSC 77 for trans 77. And the lecturer was telling us that he sold that's what he learned. He knows there's Q basic and there's those visual, all those things, but he doesn't know them, so he can't teach us. So we should learn this one, even that one on paper. I do my programming, I write about eight lines, and he tells me it's wrong. My friend does three lines, and it's correct. At the end of the day, I can only complain, but I don't know how to do it. That is how unpractical, if there's a word like that, that's our educational system is here. That place, dead. By the time you finish, you write 5,000 words. You are learning cross-referencing. Mm -hmm. You are learning how to. You are reading about journals. You see, they are very practical. When we are about to do our project, our thesis, what we call project work here, the man tells us that I think that is where we are lacking in Ghana. Everything that you are doing, is everything is engineering. Bring the topic. You've come here, you are drinking this way. Civil engineering. You can decide that, okay, I need to do a platform. Say that the bottle can walk towards me and just let me drink easily. Make your project work practical. Solve a problem. It's an existing problem. If it's that good, they will patent it or carry it further. Don't go and pitch what somebody has done. And like he said, there's 10 it in. You can't go and copy somebody's work and present it. It will write from there. It will tell you that you've done garbage. Your work is garbage. Plagiarism. Your work is garbage. Paraphrase it. What is ten eighteen? It's recognized three or four words put together. So once you write it, knowledge and believes that if you are given a topic, write about made entirely concept. We are given this topic to write on ourselves. Write thousand words. There's no way we can have about four or five words in a sentence all grouped together from different distance. But I will use a word. I will say he bought a car. He will say he purchased a vehicle. He will say that he, I mean, he can have something different because you don't think alike. That is how the white man wants you to think. think outside the box. Even at university level in Ghana, they are doing define this. What is this? 
state ray uses of. I mean, that's not. At the end of the day, you memorize, you go and pour, you get 100%. But if the question was more practical, you realize that it should solve a problem. They give you. I was, I was trying to ask them about their first degree. Maybe that is when they will tell you that they do the what is. You get to second degree, do how? Third degree, you have to solve a problem. You have to add to knowledge. That is what they call doctorate. You don't go there and copy them. You, you are going to sit by a panel, convince them that, okay, I've learned one way that a TV, if you turn a TV upside down, it will not work. Doctorate is not about, uh, you should do something extraordinary. Convince them that you try solving a problem this way and it didn't work. So anybody who wants to do it next time shouldn't do it this way. You can have your doctorate out of it. Because at the end of the day, if you knew the answer, you didn't even start solving it. You do proposals that, okay, I think that Ghana, the way our weather is, if you're able to synthesize, you can get snow. They, it can snow in Ghana. People tell you that it's not possible. You, somebody will tell you that you can grow some. Some of these foreign fruits here, you can get them. Somebody, no, 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 it can't be done in Ghana. It's a whole doctorate easy. Somebody can do it before you realize you are growing them here. So their education is more practical. Right from the age of 16, you should know what you're about. If you want to be a design engineer, you get to the university, you are learning computers and stuff. If you want to, you have people here, they are mechanics, they are mechanical engineering. They have their own car. Some have done basic things, they can't do them. Change a battery. A battery terminal is messing up. He will call for someone to come and do. I went to Belgium and a, a, a lawyer was doing his own electrical works in his house. In fact, tell you what, I was, me, my boss was here, I was very ashamed civil engineer like myself, the things the man was doing, I, I, I marvel. I tell him that, oh, we need a plumber to come and face this hot and cold. He tells me that, seriously, DIY, he brings YouTube, he opens it, tells you that, you know, you can face this tube. He, well, he's a lawyer, advocate. He's a lawyer. That is how practical they are. The things that you learn, everything can be learned. But we live in a system that people have passed, they are electrical engineers, they are civil engineers, they are mechanical engineers. All they know is book. They get to the field. They don't know anything. I had a meeting class. Manoj, he, he told me that he did two years. Then his third year, he went out to the field for one year. Then he came back to do his final year. I think Ghana, we should be doing some of these things so that we will be getting graduates. They know what they're about. You do maybe two years at KNUSD. You go out for two years. Then you come and do a final year. So by that time, by the time you come back to school, you are coming to do your project. You, you've had practical hands-on experience. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the things. You see, we can't re reinvent the wheel. But we should be learning from where are these people developing? Why are we still sitting here and we can't even do a matches? We can't do toothpick. Those are some of the people should start thinking outside the box. That even tea roll and stuff it should be imported. Pampers and stuff. I mean, why diapers? The system looks frustrating for you in Ghana. For me, very, very frustrating. I always tell people that when I was a kid, I'm almost four decades on this planet. I saw Ghana, there was Volta Condi made in Ghana. I saw matches. There was this Ghana matches. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I saw um, tomatoes, tin tomatoes made in Ghana. Mm -hmm. I went to STC yard mm -hmm. and I knew that I was leaving Takrada at 12 a.m., 12 p.m. I get to Accra by 2.30 or 3 o'clock. Mm -hmm. That time it was two and a half, three hours. Mm -hmm. If you take the dawn bus, you are sure. If you take 2.30 bus by 4.30, 5 o'clock, you are in Accra. But now you get everything is based on the car being filled before it leaves. You get to Accra station, so every day you need to waste a whole day. If you want to get, get to Accra tomorrow morning, you can't tell someone that, oh, I'll be there by 3 p.m. No way. You need to say, okay, if you want to get to, people even tell you, ah, no, no, if you want to get to Accra by 3 p.m. tomorrow, then you have to leave here by 6, 6 30 in the morning. There's traffic at Budumbram, and that traffic takes about 4 to 4, 5 hours. So, I mean, this is the system you are living in. You get to station and hold a bag, everybody's cheating everybody. Then someone who uses hand, carry it and tell you that pay 15 cities. And I'm like, so what is the measure? Ah, you too know these people. Is, and I'm like, seriously, can there be a skill? Can there be a skill that people who hold people back? I, go, I get to buy watch here and I say, um, give me three cities. Okay. Then the woman will decide how much to give me. <laughs> so, three cities on her terms. On her terms. You even tell her that, give me small shit. I tell her, I won't give you shit. Up. <laughs> no, 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 my shit. Up, it's okay for you. You see, some might think that these are trivial, but it's the corruption yeah. and the problem starts from there. When you're not sure how much you are getting, somebody, uh, people pretend to be working and the system prepare, uh, pretends to pay them. People, <laughs> everybody's cheating everybody. You want to take a taxi here, somebody will say, oh, I'm going to Lagos now, give me 10 cities. 
somebody can give me 12 CDs. Somebody can buy. We have meters. I know very well that when I'm from Langston, I'm going to campus, and he puts on that meter, I'm going to pay £6.20. Maximum, if it's at night, I'm paying £6.50. That's what I paid all my life in UK. No matter what, if it, if it will go up just by 20p, everything is regulated. Even in China, ordinary cartons that you are buying, you have to weigh it. Even rubbish, rubbish is weighed. They make sure that nobody cheats anybody. But that system here is not very frustrating. You know, there have been times you even come back, you want to impart knowledge, and you get to places and, and, and so what? You, you have this grade. They don't want to learn new ways of doing things. They don't want to. So for me, it's a complex system. But we are Ghanaians. We can't stop talking. We can only hope for the better. But the system now, if you compare to what is out there, I would say that UK for now will be about maybe 150 years ahead of Ghana. You get to the library and you don't need to talk to anybody. You just put your card, student card on, and it opens for you. You want to borrow a book, you just put a card there. This is how advanced they are. They don't, the human interface is being removed every day. You get to the bank, you have your money, you can deposit your money without seeing anybody. You, put, you have coins, you put them in there within a second. They tell you you have one one pound fifty. That is how well they are really moving forward. But our system, we seem to be progressing every day. The system, people, sometimes I get agitated. They go out there, they learn, but when they come back, the, the typical French system, everybody's marching left. So once you decide to march right, <laughs> you are the odd one out because they are in there's uh, there's symphony. They are they sy well synchronized. <laughs> that everybody is calling this color blue. You come and you tell them that no, 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 it's black. You say, ah, why? Are you worried? When I said blue, didn't you understand? You are a minister and uh, you are an MP and there's a funeral and come and pay 2,000 and you are telling me your salary is only 10,000 cities. I mean, I am a you So I think that it's a whole canker in the system. And not only to education, we need to even, we need to foster it. Over the years, the same problems, you come back, you complain. They took us out there. Uh, for me, sometimes I'm very bold to say it because I think, just like you said, at the final phase of the interview, those are the things they want to see. When you come back, will you be bold enough? Will you be emboldened when you are talking? Is it an authority? It's not that I've read that, I've heard that. You saw it. Practically, what people are doing. I had mates who were not serious in uh, getting 100 over 100. Before we finish in September, 99% of my mates had gotten jobs already. They had gone for interviews in June, July, awaiting MSc. They were waiting for the results, but they had had the jobs because they had gone for interviews and they saw the output. What about in Ghana, coming back? Is it difficult to readjust? Very difficult. Jobs, interviews, everything. You see, we don't... In my field of endeavor, maybe we are now trying to champion it. The, build, the, the, the type of projects we want people to undertake so that you solve a lot of housing deficits, you solve a lot of um, electricity deficits. That's not the direction people are looking at. Sometimes, I sit back and I, I went to home, I saw a lot of wind gushing. I read articles that the wind speeds there are over 50 kilometers per hour. Last time I took a standing fan, I stood at one place, tell you what, and I will not believe it, the fan was waving, was like there was electricity. The fan was, I didn't even know that the fan, if it's facing, it it's has been programmed said so that it can be turned on itself, it doesn't need really power to really be going left, right, left, right. It was holding me like this. Why am I pushing it there? This is the technology our electrical engineers says, that should be looking at. Renewable sources of energy. I believe that you can have some of this wind energy seriously done here. Solar energy. Initial cost might be expensive, but we, it is practically... People are having three months of sunlight in Belgium and Italy, and they are doing solar. Why we are having about 11 to 10 to 11 months of sunshine, and we are, we, are, we, are, we are practically doing nothing about it. We have people finishing doing projects, copying for their thesis because they just want to pass. But somebody will tell, will appeal to your conscience that whatever you are doing, forget the marks you are going to get. It's important to take you to the next level, but make sure that. Your project solves a problem in society. Golf, if you play golf, how can engineering, your civil engineering, impact on the golf course? Go there and see practically what a problem that they have. I mean, I, I will always share some of those um, topics or discussions that we had prior to our project. They took a whole week to lecture us on it that. Do something, have a thesis statement. You yourself go out there, explore, and come up with something. They only guide you. They'll tell you that, you know what, 
like Ghana, yeah, you take it and the lecture will be cancelling them and telling you what you're going to write. No, you tell that it's only guiding you. It's your project. At, at MSC, it's your project. If you do it well, you can develop it to a doctorate level thesis. I'm only guiding you as a supervisor. Even at a point in time, I might not even mark it. They'll give it to a third marker to mark. But me with the knowledge, I'm only helping you to really uh, make sure that this is academic writing because we, call, we have something called ethics. Mm -hmm. People are doing case study for the whole UK, for the whole, mm -hmm. even in their home countries in um, Armenia, um, Saudi Arabia. I've seen first degree thesis, somebody who did something in his home country because there's information, enough information to do it. So our system here is only we are really just training people with who come out knowledge, very smart, but practically they are not developing the nation. That's how I see it. Right. Uh, the system. Is it frustrating to you? Who will go and come back and say it's not frustrating? <laughs> you don't need your brother to tell you this. Mm -hmm. yeah. You see, the system has been made such that whether you like it or not, directly or indirectly, you will be corrupt. One way or the other. And sometimes, um, it's funny, whether the things that, I always used to argue with Nana on this one, whether the things that we were taught when we were kids, our parents really want us to make it practical when we grow up. Because I'll be working with Manucho here in the same firm. Yeah. Then probably we also grew up together in the same neighborhood. Yeah. And we are working in the same firm. I know my, my, Manucho is making shady deals and he's buying cars yeah. and doing building houses. But I will be living on my salary <coughs> and living as I should. My parents will call me and ask me, Fred, are you not working with Manito? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> how, how come he's able to build a house and you, you have worked with the same company for 20 years and you have not been able to do what he is doing? Because you are not smart, and if I tell them that uh, this is that, then you can also hear yeah. me. So, so they train you not to be a thief when you are you are young, but when you grow up, they will tell you to be a thief. Yeah. Do you get it? If you insist on not doing it, you will say, Ah, leave him. He got this position, and he could not do anything yeah. for the family. Sometimes it's even more difficult with your junior siblings, yes. your junior brother or sister coming back home and showing them love, buying a car for yeah. them, and you are still living under their roof mm -hmm. because the system is frustrating. frustrating. You have to also go and see. Sometimes, see, so I, it, it, it's not just um, the system is yeah. geared towards material, and yeah. we celebrate people who have material, regardless of how it was acquired. Once they have our value system, until, first of all, we change our value system. Because in UK, I remember I joined the queue, mm -hmm. and everybody looked at me, and mm -hmm. the, the way they look at you, you know that they'll tell you black food. Yeah. They are telling you, they are insulting you. Of course. You. They, they, although, nobody will tell you, you know that they are saying black food. Because everybody, look, from the oldest person to whoever, no protocols will come and join the queue when they are boarding the bus. I remember um, Looney. He once came, he's, my, he's a doctor, and uh, he once came and I was ahead of him in the queue. Normal Ghanaian stuff. Oh, see if you see your lecturer, and maybe you see your lecturer, you leave the queue, you give him yeah. the, the right to board. He, he looks at me and says, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Then he went, I mean, three people back and uh, was in the queue to where he stood before, but here you say the lecturer comes, everybody should give him protocol. I yeah, should take his bag, and somebody must carry his bag. Yeah. See, yes, they are good, but you see, they also foster corruption. Yeah. Everybody wants to be that person. If he, if he can't get there by his intellect, you would have to find a way to yeah. steal and get to that position. So, you see, it's the way our society values things. And that is value things. It's, it's, it's the core of our problem. No, but you see, it's right from the churches. I mean, even in the church. And I don't want us, I don't want yeah, us to believe. Really, they, they are supposed mm -hmm. to even do help to mm -hmm. streamline the system, but they are rather 
the major corporates that people are in there, profits and stuff, and the people are doing shady deals and bringing the money, and they are giving well, high echelons of positions. How can they really help? Yeah, yeah, I mean, tell you with the system, yeah, <laughs> if we have to speak about it, because of time, we would want to really bring everything yeah. to an end. But you have the president sitting in front of you. What would you tell him? I'll tell him that so far so good. But I believe that we can't reinvent the wheel. We can only learn from what others have done. And education, I'm particularly happy. I'm one person, if no Ghanaian is. I have my own issues with them. Those who follow me on Facebook know I really, really bash them when it gets to some point. But it's first love that he wants to make education accessible and free. At that level, we might not see the initial results now. But we should give ourselves 10 years if things go well and the kids that we are investing in are well tilted to believe that making it free for you doesn't mean that uh, you, you don't have to learn. But 20, 10 years now when you are doctors and you are pharmacists and you are engineers, you should pay your taxes. You should be ready to pay your TV license. I did not enjoy it so I'm not really <laughs> too much interested in that. Pay them so that others can enjoy from your fruit. So I personally will tell him that he should look at corruption he should with eagle eyes. Once it's perceived, even perceived, I talk of truth, let the person walk off the stage. Make sure you, you've really done thorough checks on the person before you bring him back. I personally feel that if corruption is made a major issue and really look that we take the partisan uh, eyes, spectacles, and make it bipartisan, everybody really works on it. You'll get far on this. So, if I personally, that's what I'll tell him. I don't believe in him. I believe in systems, I believe that schools hospitals and stuff is the duty of government. I will not really use it against them. But issues like taxes, that is now trying to tackle health, health of your people, which you are not doing so well. You should look at them. Maybe we live in a system immigration is not an issue because people don't even want to come here. They, UK and stuff, it's a big issue because the, the land of milk and honey, people are selfish. They don't want others to come and enjoy. So I personally will tell him that education and corruption, these two major ingredients, if he yes, really places a uh, uh, priority on them, Ghana might just get there. It might not be so much in there, but for me, we are not even a developing country. We are a third world country. For lack, for everything truth, we are not developing. I would say countries like China and co, they are not there yet. They are not like the Americas, but they are developing. I said Malaysia and co, they are really catching up where everything is uh, very, very good. But we are in a third world country. Nothing is working. Cultural shocks. I get to UK, I have friends, as um, he talk, guess what, he, he makes a call and they come and replace it, 3,500, he doesn't pay a dime. He tells me that, oh, but it's their duty to come and replace it. That is how, friend has a phone, if the phone falls down, he goes, they give him a new phone, he brings the phone to come and show me. Okay. Um, I mean, this, these are systems that yeah. we might not get there, but corruption, education, yeah. if these things are really tackled with mm -hmm. alacrity, mm -hmm. I believe Ghana will be a better place. Very briefly, the president in front of me, what will you tell him about the systems and everything that needs to be done? I'll take it in about three folds. Briefly. I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. The Bible says it's only righteousness that results in nation. So, my brothers take on corruption. Mm -hmm. Righteousness. Righteousness. Mm -hmm. If the system will well, we put in things that would ensure righteousness in the system, not righteousness in the human being, mm -hmm. but righteousness in the system. You have a system that is so much wrought with corruption mm -hmm. that you can't even say it. And the funny thing is that I always have the saying, nobody takes a bribe and takes a receipt. Yeah. <laughs> who, who pays a, who takes a receipt when he's taking a bribe? Then, smart, smart people want to table talk. They don't even want checks. Mm -hmm. So you, you can't tell me that I know this person did it and ask me for evidence. How? There's no receipt to prove it. How can I prove it? <laughs> do you get it? But there are things that we all can do. That that's we can the first. That's the righteousness in the system. And the second? But then my second tip. Access is everything. Mm -hmm. See? And we are in a technological age. Mm -hmm. Before I can get to this place, if the door is not open, mm -hmm. I won't be able to get in. Education my brother is talking about. You mentioned YouTube, you mentioned Facebook, you mentioned whatever. Number one is access. If I can't pay for internet, yeah. if internet is not ubiquitous, yeah. how can I do it? Mm -hmm. See, and these are things that goes beyond the individual. Yeah. 
in whatever capacity I I I have I am until these rates are brought down, that speed won't come. Because if everybody wants to have wants to be able to pay with a card mm -hmm. or something, mm -hmm. it should be running online. Mm -hmm. Now, if I will pay internet so much for internet that if I come and put um, a payment system here and my internet bill would make me uncompetitive, do you think I'll bring it here? Mm -hmm. It would never work. Mm -hmm. If you have students, you are in a global village. Mm -hmm. Here we are talking about wisdom based and knowledge based. Mm -hmm. If you have students who are shelved and they don't have access to material from elsewhere or even are able because you go to YouTube and you see even if you can't have it in practice you see a video on it which will give you a visual aspect of whatever you are doing and be able to move with it you can't have access to internet so how can you move? and your third? my third this is where the politics will come Africa, so briefly because of time yes. Africa unity African unity. Yes. See, it's funny. We, the youth of today think Africa unity is not important. Mm -hmm. But until that is done, like I'm going to come up with it, our developmental efforts will be meaningless. Mm -hmm. He talks of the matches factory. He talks of other products. Mm -hmm. You see, all these things that we are talking about, they are produced elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So if you have a production line in Ghana and it, it produces and Ghana's market is saturated. But you are not producing one thing. You are producing in a batch. And let's say a particular batch of a thousand, and everybody buy it, we get to a point, Ghana's market is, will be much saturated. Why are you going to sell it? You can't take it to Europe and go and sell it. So if you want to sell, and whatever thing that we studied in school, there's a business out of it, aspect of it. So if there are no places to go and sell the product, where can the people also have the opportunity to come and practice whatever they have learned? Do you get it? Yeah. So Africa's unity for me it's key. is key. This is extensive, Jack, and I've really enjoyed this interview. And I was I'm an alumnus of the Robert Gordy University and a proud Talu scholar. And these are my mates on the Talu Group Scholarship Scheme. I attended Robert Gordy University in Aberdeen. UK. I hope you've listened and learned a lot. This is extensive chat and on behalf of the entire team led by Emmanuel Ampabin and Richard Woolley. Good night.